Hi, good afternoon. I hope you're all well. Uh, Ruth is a tough act to follow. Uh, fair play to you. That's very, uh, very informative and entertaining. I'm going to have to exit out of this. And to be honest, there's going to be a bit of repetition in our messages, but it's going to be delivered by a slightly different person using slightly different words. So hopefully it'll be interesting nonetheless. Okay, cool. Yep. So my name's uh, Dr. Keen Desmond. I'm head of innovation at Gavin and Doherty Geosolutions. For those of you that don't know us, we're a specialist offshore engineering consultancy based in Ratfarnham County, Dublin. We were founded back in 2011. And interestingly enough, we kind of started off as a, almost an R&D project. It was a EU funding that uh, my boss, uh, Paul Doherty, bought in, was kind of what provided seed capital for the business back in those early days. And since then, we've grown and grown and grown. Um, so today, since 2011, we've been involved in 40 gigawatts of offshore wind energy projects in 12 different countries around the world. And at the moment, we hire about 160 staff. Started off with a team of five, up to 160 in a period of what, just over 10 years. So it's pretty uh, massive growth. So we've got a real multidisciplinary team. So we started off primarily with geotechnical engineers, and that's still the kind of uh, the core of the business and what we offer. But over the, whatever, 11, 12 years and uh, 40 gigawatts of projects, we expanded out the offering that we have. So geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, environmental scientists, energy engineers, economists, marine biologists, social scientists. So it's this lovely multidisciplinary team and we all work together to support the sustainable design and development, primarily of offshore wind. Um, but 80% of our business is in the offshore wind energy game and about 20% is uh, everything else. So my job is head of innovation, um, which is a great title, which I, I love having. <laughs> uh, but what do I actually do? Um, so look, the, the, the role entails working across the GDG portfolio. So we've got about eight different uh, service sectors within the company. And what I do is I deal with all the service sectors. Every um, year, I have a meeting with the lead of each service sector. And I say to them, right, who's your current clients? What services do you offer them? Who do you expect your clients to be in five, 10 years down the line? What services do you expect to be offering them? And with that conversation, then I've got a roadmap for my R&D um, operations throughout the year. So we're across the GDG portfolio to ensure we have the knowledge, connections, and expertise to meet the future needs of our customers. That's what the job's all about. At the moment, I got about 40 active R&D engagements. This is everything from a big um, Horizon 2020 project, an SEI project, maybe an interreg project, maybe a, a fellowship where we've got a, a student working with us for a couple of months, and maybe just a small internal funded research project. All told, got about 40 active R&D engagements at the moment. I have got 15 PhD students, five senior researchers. If we we're a university, they'd be called postdocs and about 50 part-time staff in 2021. So in 2021, about 50 members of the GDG staff had the opportunity to work in an R&D project. And that's what we try to facilitate, give everyone a chance to get stuck into R&D. And uh, yeah, offering that service is something that I'm, I'm very proud of being able to achieve. We, our research, our 40 um, research engagements are divided into eight what I call research clusters. I won't go into all these in detail because we'd be here a long time, although it'd be fun. Everyone would enjoy it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so the, the research clusters that we have is a floating wind design, advanced fixed wind design, drone services, advanced offshore site characterization, geothermal energy, sustainability, green hydrogen, and climate adaptation. So there's a whole pile of work going on. Each of these would have somewhere between three and six um, R&D engagements going on at any one time. Previous to being in GDG, I was in MARI, so that's Ireland's uh, National Centre for Energy, Climate and Marine. Uh, research I was there for six years, uh, highly active in uh, mostly EU um, funding acquisition for the six years I was there. Previous that is in Loughborough University in the UK, uh, where I started my first R&D project back in 2010. So similar enough kind of timeline to root. Uh, so yeah, I, I also have the scars to, to prove the, the, the long journey in the R&D game. So look, I've been working in R&D for about 13 years. I'm going to try and give you the benefit of it in just 13 minutes. Isn't that exciting? Um, look, I won't claim to be an expert. And one thing I've learned from 13 years of working in R&D is if someone says they're an expert, your alarm bell should start ringing, all right? So I am not claiming to be an expert here. I'm just going to give you the benefit of my own, my own experiences. So what I'm going to try to do is break it into three sections. So why do we do R&D? How do we R do R&D? Which is very similar to the Ruth's uh, breakdown, interesting enough. And then just some general thoughts at the end, okay? So first off, why? Why do we do R&D? So the main objective of why we get involved in R&D no matter who you are and what your background is, is to solve problems, okay? Everyone that's working in an R&D project is there. The kind of thing that unifies people is to solve problems. 
In academia, they've got kind of underlying motivations, so they're there to solve problems, but they're also looking to graduate and train PhD students, retain postdocs, and the kind of big thing that gets academics out of bed in the morning is to publish papers. That's, uh, that's the, the, the financial reward in the academic world is to get papers published. So that's the big reason um, academics tend to be involved in R&D projects. From an industrial perspective, I couldn't find one with a euro there, and so we'll go with dollars. From an industrial perspective, it's slightly different. It's, it's about accelerating growth. So you're there to solve the problems that have been set out by the, the, the funding agency, but your kind of underlying reason is to accelerate growth within the company. The way I kind of visualize a company uh, is, is like this. It looks like a little bit of a, a Petri dish, perhaps, but uh, different uh, service offerings or bacteria inside in that, uh, in that Petri dish, not to, not to kind of completely murder the analogy. Um, so th that's the kind of way I visualize it, right? So you've got this kind of your economic footprint of your company and the things that you do within the company, whether you're a software house or you're a consultancy or you're producing some kind of widget, right? So that's your, your kind of offering. And then what tends to happen, and what happened with GDG, is you got one service offering, and then your client starts saying, hey, could you do this? And you go, yeah, you know what, we could do that. So you start doing it, and then that grows itself, and then it maybe gets bigger, and it splits into two separate service offerings, right? So that's kind of the way it's tended to work with us in GDG. An example there would be, we were doing a whole pile of ground modeling. Uh, so taking geophysical and geotechnical data from offshore surveys and turning it into a numerical representation of the structure of the seabed. And we're doing that, and we're having a great time doing it. And then our clients were saying, look, could you get involved earlier? Can you help us when we're actually planning the survey to make sure that we're collecting the right data and collecting it the right way? So we did, and then we grew this service sector, which is uh, survey management. And it grew into a whole service sector, and it's been very successful for us. So it's, um, it's just the, kind of the way I kind of see the kind of growth within a company. And then if you keep repeating that and you keep growing, you grow the, your Petri dish or the, the economic um, footprint of your company. The kind of R&D that we get involved in then is there's kind of two types, kind of two broad kind of categories of R&D that we indulge in. Uh, the first one is where, where we are refining our existing offering. So we're doing something, we get involved in R&D so we can do it better. All right, good example here, one of my colleagues, one of my PhD students, uh, David Boyd, who are partnering with Queen's University Belfast, uh, really smart guy. What David's doing is we are, we've been doing some work previously in GDG where uh, wind farms are coming to the end of their lifetime and people are trying to decide what should we do with it. It's, it's 25, 30 years old, what happens next? Broadly speaking, your options are uh, decommission, repower, or extend, and it's a kind of, there's a, a framework, well, we're developing a framework, in fact, to come to the, uh, to, to the resolution of that question. What David's doing is using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So taking all the SCADA data that you have over the 25, 30 year lifetime of the, of the project and using machine learning to try and get some insight into the remaining useful operational life within that turbine. So please God, he'll be successful, I have no doubt, he's a great guy, and hopefully that will become uh, an expanded service offering that we have within the company. The other type we get involved in is where you, and this is the real beauty, or the, the, for me anyway, where the real kind of power of R&D and the real reward for being involved in it comes from, where it's kind of doing something that's slightly outside of your, your Petri dish, right? <laughs> um, where, that's so an example here. Um, so we recently drew down some funding from the SEI, in fact, um, and what is building on was that we've done lots of work in green hydrogen. So we've been doing lots of research and uh, consultancy work in the area of green hydrogen. We've also been doing lots of research and consultancy work in the area of port infrastructure development. So if we know about green hydrogen and we know about port infrastructure development, we bring something together here where we're looking at future fuels for, um, for seagoing vessels. So we partnered up with our uh, friends in Marai, so we got close collaborative links with uh, Jerry Murphy's group down in Marai. We got this lovely three-year project, budget of about 600K, where we're looking at uh, future fuels for uh, the shipping industry. So it's drawing on our hydrogen expertise, it's drawing on our uh, knowledge of port infrastructure, it's leveraging those close connections with the academics, and it's building essentially what will be a new service offering for us. I'm hoping it's gonna be very successful, and then we'll get to get a bigger Petri dish. <laughs> Right, so it's the two types of research projects that we tend to get involved in, so developing a new offering and refining an existing offering. What I, and what I see it as is this real uh, catalyst for existing growth. But I think I've underlined existing there. I think it's absolutely critical that you aren't completely dependent on funding, that you've got organic growth happening already, and then you can get a little injection of R&D funding, which acts as an extremely powerful catalyst. But you have to have that... Uh, underlying organic growth, in my opinion. We can maybe tease that out a bit later. And I'll touch on some reasons for that a bit later on. 
So that's it. So you got the academics who are graduating their PhDs, retaining their postdocs and publishing papers, and then industry that are looking to accelerate growth. But the thing is, you need to collaborate together, right? Uh, none of these things happen in a vacuum. It's very, very rare you'd have a project that's completely industry-led. There's usually some uh, collaboration happening with the academics. Um, it kind of added benefit then is all the PhDs and all the postdocs are going to be looking for jobs at the end of it. There's a great opportunity to build those relationships and recruit um, from the academic institutions. And you're not poaching staff here. That's how it works. That's what uh, universities are set up to do, is to grow the next uh, pot of talent, make sure they've got uh, saleable skills, and let them move over into industry. So it's very rewarding in that regard. So how do you do it? I'm going to have to drink some water. Right, so how do you do it? So you need to look at yourself first, right? So don't go looking out there and see what's going on in the world and what funding opportunities there are. Just kind of look internally, right? And see where you are at the moment, what your current service offering is and where you want to get to, where you want to be five, 10 years down the line, all right? And then you've got to start bridging the gap with these scopes. So scope one, scope two, scope three, scope four, whatever it takes to get from where you are to where you want to be. Those scopes could be anything. It could be staff that you need to be recruit. It needs to be... It could be software that you need to acquire and get trained up on. It could be processes that you need to define internally. It could be tools that you need to develop. It's going to vary massively depending on what type of area you're working in. Once you have looked internally and you understand what your needs are, then I'd start going out and seeing what the, the funding landscape looks like. National funding, we are blessed in Ireland. There, there's an incredible funding landscape. In, in the job that I have at the moment, I'm uh, fortunate that I get to work across multiple jurisdictions. Um, Australia, Netherlands, USA, UK, France, and really uh, what we've got in Ireland, it's, it's a much richer uh, funding landscape than are the countries that uh, we've been operating in. So obviously top of the list, you can't beat them, SEAI, right up there. <laughs> so these are the ones that I tend to go for. So this is in the energy space and the offshore energy space. So it's kind of you know my experience. I'm sure Ruth would have other pots that you'd be going for. So the SEAI, the EPA, the Marine Institute, uh, GSI, Enterprise Ireland, and SFI. So go look at them and you've got to work out which is the best fit for your ideas. Um, you've got to understand the motivations of the funders. All of these funders have got different reasons where they're giving away primarily taxpayers' money. So the SEI, very simple. They're trying to save the planet using renewable energies. It's nice and easy to understand their remit. Um, the Marine Institute, they're promoting um, excellence in uh, marine research. GSI, promoting excellence in geosciences. Uh, Enterprise Ireland are trying to sell stuff to people. <laughs> to be crass about it, and uh, then uh, SFI are kind of doing a bit of everything, you know. So it's just understand uh, what the motivations are of the different funders. The good way to do that is to look at previous projects that have been funded, understand what the consortium looked like, what they were doing, review the call text to the SEI, put out a very detailed call text, read it, see what type of projects uh, they're looking to fund. Um, contact relevant academics. You can see the academics that have been funded in the past, get in touch with them, have a chat, see how the, the funding works for them, and really contact the funding agency. All of these organizations here, they've got lovely people working there. Uh, get in touch with them, have a chat. They're, they're generally very open, and they're keen to get new entrants and uh, new quality uh, projects up and running. So once you know that, so you know what you want to do, you know what the funding landscape is, then start applying. Um, start, get out the pen and start writing. And as Ruth alluded to, I think at the outset, you're better off uh, partnering. Uh, so join in with someone that's done this in the past. It's a whole new world that you're going to get exposed to. Um, so get in as a partner first and understand the ropes and how these uh, consortia come together and how uh, the projects are run. Then we've got EU funding. Um, so as Louise said, there's millions and billions <laughs> available in the, uh, the EU world. It is a whole exciting and scary world. Uh, I'm glad Louise introduced the, uh, you said it's like the Bible, right? And it, it really is, right? So it's a huge book of text that it's not always clear what it means, <laughs> but the way that you can interpret the Bible is to talk to um, the priests who are Louise and, and the other, the NCPs. And like, it really, it, like it's like you're reading, you go, what do they mean? Like, what's the deeper meaning here? And uh, the only way that you find out is by being by talking to the people who were involved in the, the production of that text. So it's they're, they're, uh, the Europe's uh, representatives on Earth, so I'd, I'd highly recommend that you have a chat with them. So that's the NCPs. So we've got 15 in Ireland. Uh, they are covering everything from health to agriculture and everything in between. I had the wrong man's name down here. i got Mark Sweeney, who's actually the NCP for climate. Obviously, Louise is for energy, and Philip Chiste is kind of both energy as well, yeah. 
Brilliant, yeah, so absolutely fantastic resource. And you know, they're like the high priests, you know, they, they know how the texts work and what the text means. They also know the people that have been successful that can make those valuable introductions for you. After the NCPs, there's the Science Foundation Research Centers. We've got 16 of them in Ireland, covering everything from sustainable milk production to uh, internet of things. You know, there are 16 of them covering absolutely everything. Each of those, as far as I'm aware, has got a EU grants manager, very knowledgeable people. And look, the SFI, the way the model works is they have to bring in industry money. So they're really keen to talk to industry and understand what our interests are. And they can give you a great introduction to the academics that are going to help you to get a successful uh, research project and also help you navigate the, the, the tangled web of the, the EU funding landscape. And then, like you are today, attend workshops, training, matchmaking events, and just understand how it all fits together. And as Ruth said, there is a low success rate. Okay, uh, it's like what 10, maybe 20% success rate for EU funding, and that's one of the reasons why I really think you, you shouldn't be relying on funding. It's great to get; it gives you that catalyst, that acceleration for growth. But you need to the fundamentals need to be right. You need to have your own uh, organic growth ticking away. The way an EU project typically looks. Yep, no problem, thank you. The way a new project typically looks is you'll have work package zero or work package one, which is project management. You'll have work package four, which is communication. So work package one is, or zero is organizing the whole thing. And communications is making sure that people know about the lovely work that you're doing. And then you'll typically have three to five to six uh, technical work packages, each of which are composed of tasks. Okay, so that's the introduction to EU uh, parlance there for you. Um, <clears throat> So when you're starting out, a good role to go in for is a task lead. You're going to have a limited scope here. You might get to tick one or two at a stretch of your your in, uh, your target scopes off the list within the the project. But there's a limited writing writing effort. You've essentially got to send on your scope to the coordinator and support them with any additional text that they need. So the benefit of that is that you can be in multiple proposals. Um, you can submit the same text um, scope to two, three, four different proposals. And look. You're essentially buying lottery tickets here. So buying multiple lottery tickets can be advantageous. The other ops, the opposite in the spectrum in terms of effort then is a coordinator. So this is brilliant because you get a large scope. You could potentially get everything that you want to get done done in one project. You also get to influence the scope of the uh, the task leads and the, the work package leads around to your own particular interests, which is usually beneficial. But there is a tremendous uh, writing and coordination effort if the project gets awarded a tremendous co uh, coordination and administrative burden um, and typically it's seen as being um, poor form to be coordinating a task and be involved in other tasks and to be honest it's kind of hard to if you're if you're writing one anyway because it's such a huge effort so if you're coordinating you're probably going to be involved in one um, call one proposal per call which is going to reduce your success rate because you know you're buying lottery tickets as i said and then a work package lead is kind of maybe the happy medium and fits in there um, somewhere in the middle. And look, it's like a peloton, right? You got all these uh, people with their different jerseys, all kind of racing towards get the, the research funding in. Um, the person up the front is breaking through the wind, they're putting in their hard yards, the people at the back are just maybe coasting along. But what I would strongly encourage is to take the opportunity to get up the front. All right, that's what we did in Mara, it's what we did in GDG. So obviously you gotta work out how the whole thing works from a funding landscape and from a project management perspective. But when an opportunity comes up to lead, I would highly recommend that you, you grab that opportunity. Um, even if you don't get the funding, but you bring together a really strong proposal, you're going to get a name, you're going to get a reputation. I think the Irish people in particular were, were, were good communicators, were good networkers, right? And uh, I think, the, the, in my experience, a project that's coordinated by someone from Ireland it, it tends to go well, and uh, it tends to people tend to get on quite well. And that echoes what Louise was saying previously. So I'd highly recommend get in there, give it your all, blast through the, the wind and, and break the wind for the, the people riding in your wake. And then what happens is you get exhausted from it, you can drop back into the peloton. But what will happen is the phone starts ringing, right? So you don't have to go out chasing research funding. If you develop a reputation as being a good coordinator, uh, sorry, a good uh, proposal writing coordinator and potentially a good project coordinator, the phone starts ringing. People are uh, asking you to get involved in their proposals uh, to join their pelotons to, to stretch the analogy. Really critical to maintain focus, right? So when you're in this peloton, you're just kind of cruising along and you're going wherever it's going, right? But you need to make sure that you're getting value out of it, that what you're doing in those projects is what you set out to do. You can very quickly get derailed and end up doing something that, you've, that isn't adding value to your business. So just keep looking back at where am I? Where am I trying to get to? Is this actually 
uh, adding value. So maintain that focus, absolutely crucial. One thing to be aware of as your company grows, your funding rate goes down, as we, as we saw earlier on. That's just the way it works uh, because of the EU rules and regulations, right? The, your funding level starts dropping down the bigger your organization gets and your overheads as a business start going up. If you've got two people in the office, you've got a low overhead. If you've got 150, you've got quite a high overhead, right? So what that can mean is if there's a 65% with 25% effective funding rate, depending on what the overheads of your business are, you might actually be down at a 40% effective funding rate. So you just really need to keep an eye on that bottom line and see if it does make sense for you to continue your journey in the R&D landscape. And like what we ask ourselves is a question, could it be faster and cheaper to fund this internally? Big, long timeline, right? So if you're, you got an idea, you want to develop a widget, right? You got to get out to Brussels and encourage people to include text which would be favorable to you in the call text. The call comes out, you might be six months building your uh, consortium. You apply for it, it might be six months before you find out that you've got it, another three months before the project gets up and running. And then when it gets up and running, you get all the administrative burden associated with it. So it's very long timelines. So ask yourself, would it be better off just taking the, the funding that we're going to put into this and pay for something short, sharp, internally? Just some general thoughts then to wrap up. And uh, Sorry, thank you for the, the notice. Some general thoughts. So look, as I said, it's a really effective catalyst for organic growth, but I firmly believe that that organic growth is fundamental. You can't be fully dependent on it. Um, it's just too slow and too uncertain to be your only vehicle for growth. I will say national funding is a lot better. So if you're talking maybe uh, 10 to 20 percent at the EU level, for national, you might be 30 to 50 percent. So it is better uh, nationally, but still it is slow and it is uncertain. So you have to have that, uh, the fundamentals need to be right. You need to have that uh, organic growth. Um, my kind of general experience with EU projects and the energy space is that they're moving to larger and more applied projects. So when I did my own PhD, it was a, a load of uh, fluid mechanicists uh, working with CFD models and playing in wind tunnels. Those days are kind of gone now. It's kind of more kind of large scale applied research. And really that's kind of good for industry because you know, we've, got a, we've got infrastructure that, uh, that we can do testing on, for instance. And there's a bit of an opportunity there with Brexit. We don't know what's happening. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Louise does. If they're in or out, it, it, it seems to change very regularly. Um, it brings a lot of, well, I don't mean, you know, anyway, I mean in terms of the funding and how the funding works. And it, 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 it is uncertainty around it, right? So uncertainty brings risk. So people are starting to kind of maybe move away from UK partners a bit and looking for um, Irish equivalents to, to jump in there, we have found. So there is a bit of an opportunity there associated with that. We're the only uh, English-speaking country left in Europe, right? And, and proposals are written in English, so there's a good opportunity in that regard. Um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, participation in research funding is absolutely superb for what we do, which is developing services, and what Root does is uh, developing software. But I, my feel is that it's less so for uh, development of technologies or new widgets, and maybe we can tease out the, the reason for that a bit later on. I really do not get addicted to funding. You, you, I, I, I've seen businesses that just get addicted to it and their, their kind of raison d'etre is to draw down research funding and complete research projects. Just make sure that you're doing it for something that's adding value to your business and that you're, you're not addicted to the funding. Um, open source, so there's new rules and regulations, the, the fair data principles, that any data that are collected in R&D projects have to be given to the, put into the public domain in a fair, I also forget what it might, uh, stands for, findable, accessible, uh, interrogable and reproducible. So it basically means that you have to be able to put the data out there so people can uh, reproduce your uh, experiment. That is uh, a big burden that makes it uh, more difficult to manage your, your intellectual property. It can be done and it's a, it's a good thing for society, the taxpayers' money, the fruits of it are being shared with the world, uh, but it, it just makes the kind of IP management that bit more challenging. But there's a huge opportunity there. If you see any R&D project that's happening in an area that's of interest to you, your, you can pick up the phone, you can send an email saying, hi guys, I saw your research, looks really interesting, can I have your data please? If they don't respond, you can email them, put their project officer in CC. You, you'll get the data eventually. And, th and that's the way it works. As taxpayers' money, those data are for everyone. Um, so you, know, you can only make it a full-time job just making sure that uh, drawing down the data, um, that would be of value to your business. Um, yeah, the network and uh, reputation. So being involved in R&D projects lets you, it's a catalyst for growth, but it also the, the network and reputation, you just can't put a value on that. You know, being, being working in, in Europe and uh, drawn down funding and being uh, coordinating a project, it, it's got significant um, reputational advantage that's hard to quantify. I'm gonna finish with one last slide. Dun, 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 chat GPT. 
absolute game changer. Look, we'll have a chat about it later, but I, I, I think this is just going to face, change the face of how funding works, to be honest with you. Um, so look, I've been involved in writing research proposals for over 10 years now. And when I saw this coming out, I was like, yeah, right, a computer can't do what I do. Um, but well, I gave it a go and it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, so we drew down some funding from the EPA last year, uh, which was to do with the reuse of construction demolition wastes as uh, raw materials for, for construction projects. Really lovely project we're very excited about. It took me, one of my senior researchers, a lot of time to write that text. Uh, we were working on it for weeks. And then I said, geez, I wonder how ChatGPT would get on. So I just, we'd already won the funding at this stage. So I threw the text in and the, the response that came back was frightening. And honestly, uh, it's no joke. Uh, like within, with a day of effort, you could get to about 80% of where you need to be in terms of the proposal text, uh, which, which is usually a week's um, which is usually takes weeks. So it is going to change the, the face of R&D funding. I don't know what it's going to change it to look like, uh, but it's uh, certainly interesting. Um, thank you. I'm slightly over a bit nice teeth, teeth at the end. The only thing is if everybody's using it, the bar is raised and we're still competitively bidding, mm -hmm. so it's still an even playing field. <laughs> um, right, we're going to open up to the floor now um, for questions. Mike will come down to you and yeah, if you could just say your name and where you're, you're from. Hi, I'm Asker. I'm with Viotas, and we are already we have a EU project with IES, the Ibercom project, so we're involved in that as well. So interesting to see that. But um, I, I guess the question I have really is: say we're operating with um, a much smaller PMO as opposed to IES, who has IES and IES R and D 